The Orioles were in their time, but not quite of it. The biggest black record of the late 40s was, quote, open the door, Richard, end of quote, a broken beat novelty number. Step and fetch it in a tuxedo. It was a top 10 hit for no less than seven artists. Both Count Basie and the Three Flames took it to number one in the same month. And one has to stop over that weird fact. Impossible since the advent of rock and roll. It speaks for a world in which only a very few songs were heard, in which only a very few conversations were permissible or comprehensible. But one has to look beyond music to see how strange the Orioles really were. In the early 80s, the detritus of late 1940s and early 1950s advertisements was resurrected by a host of American and British collage fanzines, all of them inspired in one way or another by the recoding spirit of punk. And what these magazines showed, be they the kitchen table tacky world or the slickly printed stark fist of removal, was so clear, so single-minded, it now looks like an art project commissioned by the CIA. It's not just that every person pictured is white, middle class, and well-off. Black people in post-60s American TV commercials were white, middle class, and well-off. It is the sense of confidence that is so unsettling. The smiles on the faces of the men are easy, unconcerned. The fulfillment of every desire is taken for granted. The smiles on the faces of the women have come a long way from those of the wartime factory workers. They are pursed, determined. There is a hint of resentment beneath the surge toward gratification. Unfulfilled desire puts the necessary edge into the ads, constitutes the subliminal hook. And so together the men and women make a world that is both open and closed, a world that cannot be touched. In 1958, the family physician published an illustrated guide titled, You Can Beat the Atomic Bomb. Note the active verb. Twenty years later it would be, You Can Survive. A couple is fleeing radioactive fallout. They are dressed for a night on the town. In fact, they seem to be out on the town, having already heard the news, covering their mouths with handkerchiefs as casually as one might open an umbrella against the rain. It would be specious to connect the Orioles' quiet refusals to the bomb, but perhaps not, to, not so to connect those refusals to the monochromatic orchestration of confidence that accompanied them. That orchestration did not include the Orioles. In 1948, or for that matter in 1958, downtown hotels in Baltimore would not have admitted them. Restaurants would not have served them. And had Sonny Till, with new money in his pocket and his combat medals on his sharkskin suit, persisted in a demand for entrance, the police would have been called and the nigger thrown in jail. Penned in on itself, the black ghetto produced a culture of violence, hedonism, and despair. With the Orioles, Gillette writes, quote, the harsh, fast life produced a slow, gentle response, end of quote. Sonny Till became an artist of the reverie, always one step removed, a mole in the ground. Sonny Till fantasized. He ran his fantasies down. As he fell back and his fantasies slipped out of his grasp, he communicated the notion that the real world could be different from the apparent, that the apparent world, the world of ordered rhythms and distinct words, was not real. There was no confidence. There was only an erotic concentration on loss, hopelessness, and failure. Till imagined what it would mean, what it would feel like to love, to be loved, to hurt, to be hurt, to say no, to say yes. He could, he said, do none of it. But because he was imagining, he spoke with more purity than real life ever allows. His music was an affirmation, an emotive utopia, where everything could be said. It was a negation, a nowhere where nothing could be done. Negation was accompanied by nihilism, which, once glamorized in the media, was understood by young people eager for new myths as a promise of freedom. In 1947, 4,000 motorcyclists invaded the quiet town of Hollister, California and held a party. The town was partially destroyed. In 1948, four Paris teenagers, Les Tragiques Delaney, joined in an inexplicable scheme involving sexual jealousy, a supposedly eminent Soviet invasion of France, and a non-existent fortune. Three of them held a trial to decide the fate of the one who claimed to have the money, sentenced him to death, and carried out the sentence. In 1958, Charlie Starkweather, 19, and his girlfriend, Carol Fugate, 14, murdered 10 people in Nebraska and Wyoming, including Fugate's mother, stepfather, 
and half and baby half sister. Among the other victims was a couple about the same age as the killers. These events and others like them became myths almost before they were acknowledged as events, and within the matrix of the post-war rhythm, the incident most immediately and completely mythologized was one of the first to take place. In the fall of 1948, a 24-year-old gunman and triple murderer named Ivanhoe Raging, Raging Martin became a hero in Jamaican shanty towns because, advertising himself in the papers with scrawled threats and two-gun photos, trumpeting himself as Alan Ladd and Captain Midnight, he sensed the pop dimension of the nihilist role. On 9 October 1948, he was trapped by police on Lime Cave Beach and shot to death. Featuring a picture of the corpse in the sand, the Kingston Daily Gleaner devoted its entire front page to the story. Crime does not pay. Kingston's six weeks terror is ended. Rijing is dead. I saw him shot. Thousands at the morgue. Who was this man with a price on his head? Ace cop swimmer joins Hunt down the crooked road to doom. And bringing it all back home, the inevitable prosaic angle. Lime K, nature lover's haven. In time, movies would be made, songs would be written, iconographic books and sociological studies would be produced about all of these occurrences. From Laszlo Benedict's 1954 film The Wild One to Bruce Springsteen's 1982 tune Nebraska, Far from being merely trapped in legend, Rijing's event was the founding crime of post-war Jamaican popular culture, and it was always understood as such. Rijing was the ghost guiding the hand of every rude boy, the voice of every reggae singer. When Perry Hensel told the story in his 1973 film, The Harder They Come, bringing it into the present, he made Rijing the pop star that Ivan Martin wanted to be. This Rijing not only killed people, he cut records, topping the hit parade and the most wanted list at the same time. Today, these crimes would be a version of everyday news. In their time, they communicated as a violation of it. Each briefly marked a moral panic and an inflation of the moral currency. I sometimes think to, that to understand why these crimes turned into myths and why the crimes of the serial or, savor the words, recreational and theme killers of the 1970s never transcended their numbers is to understand culture. Or the day Elmer Henley Jr. was arrested in Texas for the rape, torture, murder of 27 teenage boys. The TV news happened to run an interview with Juan Corona, who was appealing his, connection, his conviction of the murder of 25 California farm workers. Well, Juan, I was sure the interviewer would ask him, how does it feel to lose the record? It was barely a fantasy. I've been reading about Gacy, and he says he killed 33. Henley told his prosecutor while awaiting trial, If you cut me some slack on the time, I can find you some more bodies and get my record back. But then Theodore Bundy reached the 40s. Henry Lee Lucas claimed 188 victims, then 600. Inflation outstripped any possibility of meaning. The only use value of a murder was its exchange value. The violations of Rijing, the motorcycle gangs, the Laney Trio, Starkweather, and Fugate were packaged and sold, but they resisted commodification. They were a kind of noise and a kind of silence. They were still sufficiently outside the limits of the public conversation to be received as art statements, as attempts to willfully construct life or to present its absence. As, as mythical assaults, they were self-justifying, art for art's sake, which is a form of nihilism. For many, these crimes and their very muteness, the noise they made, the silence they left behind, the refusal or the inability of the actors to explain themselves, were experienced as a common dream of the post-war period. Some people following the news felt they themselves dreamed these events, which, given the buried, shapeless desires for novelty, adventure, and revenge to which these events gave voice, they did. If they didn't, the media dreamed for them, after the fact, but also in advance. Just as Ivan Martin, a.k.a. Alan Ladd, saw himself in American crime movies, Starkweather saw himself in the central mythic story of his era. Nicholas Ray's 1955 film, Rebel Without a Cause. 
which dramatized the coming of age of one Jimbo Stark, as played by James Dean. For hours, Stark Weather stood before the mirror, combing his hair, arranging his slouch, positioning his cigarette, adjusting his shirt and pants, until he and Dean, Stark and Stark Weather, two ordinary Midwestern boys, the first already dead, the second knowing he soon would be, were one. It is not hard to believe that, in moments, Stark Weather convinced himself that what he wanted to do was no more than what Stark wanted to do, would have done, if Hollywood were more than a fixed game of chicken. Facing the electric chair, Starkweather refused to plead insanity. Quote, but Dad, I'm not sorry for what I did, because for the first time, me and Carol had more fun. End of quote. The appeal of Isso's crusade cannot be understood except as a systematic version of this scattered no. As an attempt to turn emerging negationist and nihilist energies back toward the creation of a new culture. Quote, the great American substitute for social revolution is murder, end of quote. The political scientist Walter Dean Burnham said at the height of the serial killing fad. Europe had other traditions, among them Lefebvre's long line of fatal spells in which Isso had found a place. Lettrism was no less bizarre and thus to a few no less seductive or exciting than the Laney killing or It's Too Soon to Know. Like the teenage Laney murderers who could not explain themselves and the Orioles who refused to explain themselves, Isso began with the rules and language. He knew, as the review La Tour de Faux would put it in 64, writing about the Situationists, that, quote, when the crisis of language and poetry is pushed beyond certain limits, it ends up placing the very structure of society in question, end of quote. For both the Lettrists and the Situationists, that crisis was the goal. To reach it, one had to say things others did not understand and thus provoke them into doubting the ability of their own language to say anything at all. The Laneites were not lettrists. Claude Pansoni, who pulled the trigger, testified at his trial that he hoped to become a writer, but he scorned the avant-garde, rejecting Rambo, frenzied and Baudelaire, morbid, in favor of Stendhal and La Rochefoucauld. Though Isso sometimes spoke of letter song hits, he never wrote Theory des Lorios, which today would be fun to read. But like the Orioles and the Laniites, letterism was utterly part of its time and outside of it, socially determined and the product of individual choice, a myth of a creation to be glimpsed in destruction. Unlike its contemporaries, letterism demanded that one explain oneself, if only in riddles and runes. More than that, it required a willingness to understand just how one's individual choice was determined and how a tension between determinism and choice could be brought to the point of explosion. Most of all, it required both a sense of history and the faith that one could willfully transcend it. The group is so gathered around himself by 1946 when he was 21, the letterists numbered more than two dozen, was full of the spirit of youth. It was anarchic and charged with strict codes of private manners, ebullient and full of resentment, ambitious and irresponsible. As opposed to every other young man youth manifestation of the late 40s, it had taken on the burden of thought. The group was drenched in theory and critique and intellectualism, but it was an intellectualism so severe, so unfinished, and in the real world so completely laughable that in concert with the ruling passion of every other youth manifestation of the time, it was never more than a few steps away from exploding into violence. The tension Iso was creating demanded more than poems. It demanded a call to action, and Iso was eager to provide it. In that invisibly convulsive year of 1948, he and his followers, followers covered the Latin Quarter with posters. Twelve million youths will take the streets to make the lecherist revolution, they read, but few paid any mind. Thus, in the next year, Isso put posters aside and formulated another theory. What was exceptional, what in 1949, when there was no such thing as a youth market, when all minds were on social integration and division, was what Charlie Starkweather was learning in general math, seemed absurd was Isso's claim that youth itself was the only possible source of social change. Isso wrote the first version of his Trait d'Economic Nucléaire, Le Solvement de la Jeunesse, Treatise on Nuclear Economy, Youth Uprising, and made an attempt to form a national youth organization, co-opting the once-scorned Breton, who, according to Isso, sniffed a new constituency for surrealism. This fell flat, but the attendant publicity attracted the man who was to prove Isso's most faithful an energetic disciple. Maurice Lemaitre, born Moise Bismuth, 
a young journalist for the anarchist paper Le Monde Libertaire and a Jewish fan of the anti-Semite Céline. He showed up to do an interview and remained as a convert, a convert in a hurry. Dissatisfied with the paltry few who rallied around Issou's youth uprising, in 1950, Le Maitre started the review Front de la Genus, Youth Front, meant as the flag of a mass student union and published Issou's unsigned Our Program in the first number. Radically anticipating Herbert Marcuse, Paul Goodman, and their epigones in the 1960s New Left, is so produced an analysis of youth as an inevitably revolutionary social sector, revolutionary on its own terms, which meant that the terms of revolution had to be seen in a new way. Isso's argument was grounded in the notion of insiders and outsiders, internists or co-exchangists. Those with something to sell within the market economy and the means to buy what others sold, and externists, those with nothing to sell and no means to buy. <laughs> Youth were automatically outsiders, people who could neither freely produce nor consume. But if society was a structure of buying and selling, then the young were not people at all. They were mere luxury items, utensils. Since they could not take part in the circuit of exchange in real social life, they could only seek out and expend units of gratuitousness, aimless and conscienceless activities, juvenile delinquency, or whatever degraded trivial commodity compensations they could find, new clothes. There was an opening in this argument, and Isso dove through it. If economic facts defined youth, then youth could not be defined strictly by age. Rather, youth was a concept, and it could be enlarged to include anyone who was excluded from the economy, and anyone who, through volition, or for that matter dissipation, refused to take a preordained place in the social hierarchy. It was only among those who, whatever their age, were not encumbered by the routines of family and wage labor that one could find the source of revolution. By 1968, this was a cliché, if not a full-fledged ideology. Our answer, said Robert F. Kennedy as he campaigned for the presidency of the United States, is to rely on youth, not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity of the appetite for adventure over the love of ease. In 1950, well before an organized market appeared to capture Isso's units of gratuitousness, before the youthful demand for cultural autonomy was sealed by the wild one rebel without a cause rock and roll explosion of signs, before the youth market turned into a shadow electorate, it was pure fantasy and right on the mark. <laughs> 